delighted to represent the IMAC today because I sit on the committee for the Southwestern Centre, the railway division. Um, I work for Chilton Railways, but not everything that I've presented has been part of my daily duties. So uh, this is very much a general take on the sort of things I get involved in in the railway industry with regards to adhesion, chronological account, and with as little bias um, in relation to rolling stock as possible. Try to link it as much as possible to permanent way matters because I'm aware of my audience. So um, it's also a pledge from me that we as a, as a division, as a committee, are very motivated to continue these sorts of events. We've got a joint event with the PWI coming up in early January, I believe. Um, details of that still to be finalised, but I think this is a really positive thing to do for similar minded institutions to come together to share best practice and to ultimately look at things from a systems point of view rather than just from a permanent way or on stock bias point of view. So where did it all start for me? Well, I have actually been always interested in trains, but my main academic interest is actually geography and geology. I've never studied it at a high level, but I spend a lot of my spare time walking coasts, reading about geology, um, and generally I love maps. I love representing natural features of landscapes and, and science, really, in, in a sort of map network style form. Um, I also come from a, a very artistic and musical family, so I play the violin, though I'm not particularly active at the moment, but my parents are both artists and our teachers. My immediate background, by my grandfather, is actually not really in engineering. It's more so from a creative, artistic, and more so from the creative, artistic background. Um, so my uncle is a um, car mechanic, um, and as I said, my grandfather, he was an engineer, he was a chemical engineer, did a lot of work on explosives, on fuels, and that. His, he had quite a big influence. He took me to a lot of engineering museums. He told me a lot about the work that he did. We would spend many a day in the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, going to Kew Bridge Steam Museum, you know, basic old school machinery. And I was very much thrown into that from a young age. Um, I was and remain very active in sport. Um, I tend to go on runs as often as I can, uh, cycle to work, play football when I can, but as I get older, I start to feel that more. <laughs> and um, as you can see in the photo, I like hiking. Um, and due to my connection in Germany, hence my surname, though I am actually, I was born here, I've always lived here, but my mother is German, so um, I've got an uncle in Germany who actually restores British classic cars to sell them at a great profit to the Germans who seem to prefer driving our cars than their own. And I think the favour has very much returned this side of the channel. So the big question, what sort of career could possibly result from all of this, this very mixed, unorthodox background for a railway engineer? Well, I started, as you would, doing your GCSEs um, I'm from South London, so I went to my local school very much. But my GCSE chosen subjects were included geography, art and music. So there wasn't really much the motivation to get stuck into the technical side at this point. Uh, engineering was more of a hobby. My career was more uh, likely to go down the creative route. And I don't regret that because it encouraged me to be creative at a young age and to think <coughs> outside of the box. I, I generally now as an engineer, when I approach a problem, I, I like to take a few steps back and think, of it, think, of, think about it outside of the box rather than go straight into solution mode and before understanding the problem. And I think that's something that you learn over time, but it's still a trap that I am guilty of and many people I've met across the industry are guilty of getting stuck in solution mode before you actually understand the problem. Uh, then I went on to do A-levels. At this point, I made the big decision. Uh, I would retain what was previously destined to be my career as a hobby, but I would go into engineering, which was a hobby previously, as a career. As a result, I chose the traditional mathematics, further mathematics, physics and chemistry, and with my family links, German as well on the side. Then I went on to university at Southampton, <coughs> Masters in Mechanical Engineering. Um, and while I was at university, I really started to accumulate some work experience. 
So again, with family connections, I was able to get in touch with some people at Deutsche Bank. Um, I did what was effectively a mini apprenticeship for eight weeks in the high-speed rail depot in Frankfurt, which was very much hands-on. It's a lot of overlapping skills to what I would do, what I would use in the in the garage, like working on cars, very much bigger scale. Then track brakes as well, magnetic track brakes and various things that we don't actually, we've never used in the UK, in some cases don't use in the UK anymore. And we're talking about trains that have got four different power systems that operate at over 200 miles an hour. That's again something that I've not really come across since. So that was a really good first insight into hands-on maintenance and uh, just the, the railway industry in general. Then I uh, very much took that home and, and the following year I did an internship at Rail Delivery Group, which was ultimately the, the, the best way of networking. I went to various depots, I met people across the industry, met, even met people from Network Rail, and that's when I really first got into adhesion by shadowing uh, meetings involving adhesion, adhesion working group, and also um, adhesion research group. And coming out of university, uh, I almost immediately joined Shorten Railways. I was lucky. Um, I applied and was successful. And that's where I've been ever since, four and a half years in counting now. And um, I quickly transitioned after the graduate scheme finished into the role I am in now, which is technical engineer at Chilton Railways. By the way, I, I welcome questions at any point throughout the presentation, um, particularly when we get onto the technical stuff. It's easier to deal with things straight away than to uh, Those flick two through slides. The degrees I am near Frankfurt, not the one by Darmstadt. Yeah, it's the one just west of the city centre on the way out towards um, Wiesbaden. So why rail? Uh, well, first of all, I am a proud spotter. That's something that I was brought up on and I've always been interested in, in traveling by train and in, in keeping up to date with current affairs. But from more of a career point of view and a, a sort of identity point of view, I wanted to join an industry that's growing. It's very much at the forefront of the UK's carbon, carbon zero strategy. Um, and this is our new hybrid flex train, which is a battery diesel electric hybrid. Um, and that's very much Chilton's flagship piece of engineering to contribute, at least start to contribute to helping as a diesel operator reduce our carbon, carbon footprint. Um, but also, rail is a combination of many of my academic interests. It's a rare technical industry that combines human geography, physical geography, multidisciplinary engineering, but most of all mechanical and electrical from an operator's point of view. Also, chemical engineering, when we look at propulsion and fuels and uh, tribology and material science. Um, and I was quickly made aware of the Railway Engineering Graduate Scheme, which is run by the Rail Delivery Group while I was on placement there. And that ultimately gave me all the skills to be where I am today, talking to you. So, to so move on to the topic I'd like to focus on today, and very much see this as a chronological account of my experiences with regards to the railway interface and low adhesion as I've gone through my career, both at university and then eventually onto industry. So to define the railway interface as I did in my bachelor's project at university, it's very much the contact area between the train wheel and the rail it's running on. And what a lot of people don't realise outside of this area is that it is only the size of a five pence coin. And as a result, it's quite a difficult thing to control and monitor. My university project at bachelor's level was effectively to understand this dynamic interaction between the wheel and the rail, or the vehicle, or a rail vehicle is in motion, and investigate how to best measure this. And that, of course, involved an understanding of the rail wheel dynamics mechanism, which is a mean which involves excitation as a result of rail irregularities such as rail roughness or corrugation, which can then be modelled to have a dynamic effect and, a propagate, a pro and then propagate into either noise or vibration. And that this is that same model effectively simplified in the form of a statics, engineering statics representation. So my bachelor's project 
the University of Southampton, it's the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research, ISVR, which is where I did this project. Just before I started, they developed what's called a corrugation analysis trolley, which I used at Old Derby Test Track to arbitrarily measure some sections of track to investigate how this is best done and what methods um, ensure optimal measurement. Um, the cat was mainly pushed at a speed of about one meter per second. And it contains a small ball bearing that runs along the rail surface and is connected to a transducer, which then feeds information to a laptop that is equipped with software to process this information and generate a roughness profile. And I'll come on to that in a minute. The cat comes with its own software and it's able to output both raw, and that's including disturbances and anomalies, displacements, but also arbitrarily filtered displacements that are able to um, generate uh, moving average amplitudes and also, which what is most useful, a decibel measure of roughness in the form of a one-third octave spectra, which involves various uh, log logarithmic equations, uh, equations to turn that um, raw displacement data into decibel noise measurement. So our methodology, uh, which I chose Old Dolby because it's a common uh, test track which a lot of rolling stock has developed on, and it, it very much is a good representation of a real piece of network rail infrastructure that you can book unlike a real railway line, which of course is subject to freight passenger traffic. So it's very much a practicality issue. Um, so go uh, at this point, I learned how to do risk assessments and method statements. That's something you take for granted once you're in the industry, but at university, it's very much a novelty. Um, it's something that's done for you, unless you're taught how to do it. And you get the hang of it, but a good risk assessment, there's an art to writing a good risk assessment, and that's something that I've really picked up in my role. So first step was to set up the cap very much on a mechanical level to manually adjust it. And I've got an image to show that in a minute. And then to practice operating it and to also be trained on the software. How to extract the software in the first place, first place but then how to process the software, uh, the, the data from the software into something that's useful. Second stage was to clean the rail and mark out the measurement regions. When you're dealing with 10 miles of test track, got to have a plan as to what you want to measure. You want to try and avoid sections of rail that are particularly contaminated, because at this point in time, the purpose was to actually have a reference point to measure against a clean section of rail, which we could then use as a zero reference point effectively to do our noise calculations on less clean or more rough or more corrugated sections of rail. And it's a case of adjusting the cap to tailored for different measurements, for example, different um, positions on the running band. That was one of the focuses of the study. And then finally, cap data processing and analysis, optimization of software, very much the extraction of data and then the processing of that data to produce something useful, but also to understand which anomalous results weren't useful and what they represented. So this is the cap close up. You can see here that we've got a measurement head of the ball bearing at the end, and it's a case of effectively calibrating that to run over the running band in exactly the position you want to measure, be that the centre of the running band, five or ten millimetres to the left or the right. Um, and it's important to notice that when you are doing these measurements, that the running band can vary in um, different parts of the track. Um, generally, more worn wheels will have a, a wider running band because they, um, they generally travel over a larger surface area of the rail due to a uh, greater wear factor, while a brand new rail uh, wheel travelling on a brand new rail will have a much smaller running band because it's, it's been refined to, and it's, it's, it's profile is, is, isn't worn, so it, it doesn't um, take up as much of a contact surface area. Yeah. So on a rail network that has a tied form of rolling stock, so take a tube line, yeah. for example, uh, would you expect a running band to sort of wear wider? If it's yes, the same definitely. Same stock, same sort of speed, i.e. Victoria line. Yeah. 
yeah, definitely. And um, I had this conversation. So someone I know really well is a um, engineering director at Greater Anglia, and he's he operate his his trains operate on some very old infrastructure, particularly in Norfolk, and uh, his uh, new uh, Stadler units, which have got brand new wheel profiles, um, have changed the position of the running band on this aging infrastructure as their contact area is in a different position. So the running band has actually been shifted by several millimetres. So on lines of mixed traffic, the interface is much more much more difficult to model. It's funny that uh, Paul should mention tube lines, because uh, I used to be fascinated looking out the window at Ealing Broadway tube yeah. station district line trains. And <coughs> if the, the running band was like the old fashioned circuit symbol for a resistor. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, I thought, well, that's London Underground for you. Isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's, it's almost a case of risk mitigation by default. Yeah. You accept the problem isn't going to go away. The option to stop tra traffic on a regular basis isn't there. So you may do from a reactive point of view with the consequences, which is you're going to have a certain level of noise and there's a tolerance band of, of acceptable noise and obviously means of, of controlling that through damping or equivalent. So to an extent, I think the noise levels on the London Underground Network at present probably exceed what would be deemed safe in a working environment, particularly on the Jubilee line and the central line, in my experience. But well, you know what stations you're between. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's one one way of. Let's come back to that. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Some thoughts about that. Yeah. Did you do any any preparation to the rail before you actually started your tests on Old Dolby? Um, uh, because depending. I mean, it is, it, it, at certain times, the, the, the test track gets used pretty often. Yeah. At other times, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it very much depended uh, how dirty the railhead was. So we had some citrusol, which we used to clean the okay. surface to produce that zero reference point on the cleaning section of the rail. But part of the purpose of this was to examine rails that you would typically find on the network, which were unlikely to have just been treated with citrusol. Um, a mixture of the two. But the, the option was there to do so. Is this sort of to, to null out the rail contribution to the wheel rail interface so that you can then look at what the wheel must have been contributing? Uh, it's to null out contaminants. It's to null out arbitrary um, disruption to right. the measurements that aren't as a result of the natural wear profile of yeah. the rail, but rather contamination by leaves, oil, or any other form of contamination. So um, it was to produce reliable results and to maintain the focus at this point, which wasn't on low adhesion, it's more so on the rail wheel interface and the effect of roughness and corrugation on dynamics as opposed to slip sliding inside. Right. So this is an example of the interface that you get from the software that the cat operates with. So you've very much got linear displacements and a um, position which you obviously have to calibrate and set up on the a, a longitudinal position along the track. So it's very important to mark out point zero, which you would do with a piece of sellotape beneath the railhead, and then work out what range of position or what, what distance of track we would monitor. And generally, the software would be more accurate over shorter distances. And, and it was most effective by taking samples and working with those samples to produce a more macroscopic uh, profile of, of that section of rail. So um, here's one of the factors I looked at. So rail roughness, uh, the running band, the position. So it would approximate the centre of the running band based on the centre of that clean section of rail. Um, and we'd 
measure the total width of that running band and then divide it into segments and look at the effect across five millimeter intervals and work out the varying uh, level of, of uh, rail roughness and subsequent um, noise um, by running the, the corrugation analysis trolley with its ball bearing over those um, individual uh, marked out positions. So we'd adjust it five millimeters at a time. And this is what would come out of, of, of that software once the data has been processed. So we've got, again, <coughs> linear displacements. We've got the um, displaced, the, the, effectively the um, linear amplitude of the displacement of the ball bearing that to get along the distance of the track. And then here, subject to log logarithmic processing, I like to call it. We've got roughness and decibels and wavelength of that noise. And you can see that generally there's a, when mapped against the uh, ISO standard, old Dolby, in all positions, including the center of the running band, is largely above the guidance provided by ISO 3095, I believe it is. So what, what were the main results and conclusions from this study? Uh, running man position, the speed of operating the trolley, and varying the filters within the software to effectively drown out anomalies and unwanted noise, significantly affect roughness. And generally, but it's important to understand by how much the roughness will increase if you deviate from that running band. And an example of how that could happen is by operating a different unit or a newer rolling stock unit on a section of track that is generally featured older, more worn wheel profiles. Uh, background noise and footfall surprisingly didn't have a noticeable effect on roughness measurement. So you had quite a lot of leeway. You could operate in a noisy environment. You didn't need to. This, in theory, could be done on a main line next to a running line with trains passing at high speed. And we, we did try to make as much noise as possible to eliminate any uh, any doubt over this. <coughs> and there's a significant spread in the roughness across the running band. So again, this is an important factor. Um, there are inconsistencies in cap speed roughness data. So generally, it is worthwhile maintaining a steady speed. It's not a good idea to uh, operate the cap trolley at varying speeds because you're basically introducing unwanted uncertainties. And despite some spreading the roughness data across the region measured, it should be sufficient, as I mentioned earlier, to measure in small segments and then to effectively scale up those samples that you take based on some inspection further down the track and the elimination of any anomalies that are likely to be pits or contamination on the railhead to give an accurate profile of that entire section of line. To improve pit identification, generally it's a good idea to take note of the exact region, take photos of any areas of doubt, and then to try and um, correlate those to the findings that have come from the corrugation analysis trolley. To basically, if you, if you have a significant pit, uh, peak in the displacement, and you have a photo in that particular position to justify that peak, it's fairly safe to say that that peak is the result of that small pit or spot of contamination on the railway. So this then leads <laughs> on to the next instant, instance on um, which I was exposed to the railway interface, which was my master's project um, looking at the viability of a tram train network for South Hampshire, so very much in the area surrounding Rowlands uh, University. So I'm sure most of you are aware, but for those that aren't, a tram train is a rail vehicle that can operate on both grooved rail, so street running, as you would see with a traditional tram network, but also on heavy rail infrastructure without, well, with very limited modifications to that heavy rail infrastructure and certainly no modifications to the railhead itself. So we talked involved in 
uh, looks to utilize existing network rail track um, and convert it to light rail operation to enable a much more frequent service between, for example, Romsey and Eastley, which is currently only hourly and single track for some of it, and diesel. So very much where at least the GBR vision of the UK railway network doesn't see us to be in the future. Um, class 399 is the only operational tram train in the UK at present. It operates between Sheffield and Rotherham um, on Sheffield Super Tram. And we looked into, I won't cover this because it's not related to the rail wheel interface, but we looked into modifying it to be compatible with not just the, uh, the um, tracks on the track side of the, uh, the permanent way side of the uh, uh, local railway network, but also to be compatible with the power supply system, which of course is mainly third rail. And the law only says that you can't lay new third rail. There's no harm in utilising what's already there because it's not going anywhere, at least for the moment. So the tram train wheel profile, this isn't my work, this is something that we looked into and did simulations on, but it's this is very much a diagrammatic representation of, of that tram train wheel profile. It's effectively, on average, a polynomial combination or curve combination of the BRPA profile and the Sheffield super tram profile, um, combining the small radius of the flanges of a conventional tram wheel from, in this case, Sheffield super tram class 399, with a more rounded standard wheel profile of heavy, wheel, heavy rail vehicles. Um, this design is proven to minimise the risk of derailment whilst keeping noise, vibration and wear to a minimum. And the University of Southampton ISVR did a lot of the testing work for that um, prior to this project. So one of the things that we did look at, um, we, we produced our own design for it. It's only only a, a high level really, but um, this this was very much one of the recommendations from one of the initial studies that was done into this whole area, was that a higher check rail would have to be developed. And that's because the flange back spacing on standard tram wheels is not compatible with network rail check rails. So the checking surface um, the tram wheels is not in the same position as the flange back. So as a result, higher check rails are needed to support the new tram train wheel profile to ensure that the hybrid tram train wheel profile is compatible with all switches, crossings and tight curves. So that was an interesting early insight into permanent way engineering for me. If only it was also easy. I mean, this was university, this was dealing with designs, with studies with simulations with test tracks and very little rail traffic in reality this is actually a photo of the railhead just ahead of the accident site at salisbury it's about as much as i'm allowed to say <laughs> enough. it's it's not what you want to find on the approach to a junction and a red signal and it's actually got a very unique surface property because it, although it looks very thick and contaminated, it can be peeled off with, with a very basic scraper. It's actually doesn't isn't very strongly adhering to the railhead. It's just that the train runs over it. It's not going to move. And it had a coefficient. The investigation, of course, is still ongoing, but the coefficient of friction on this railhead is said to be lower than has ever been seen before on the UK rail network, given the density of this leaf layer. And it's got this unique crystalline um, texture and, and surface structure that is likely to be a combination of leaf contamination that wasn't treated or removed for several days and the compression of, uh, ironically, the compression of sand, which of course is supposed to improve adhesion um, under high pressure and severe breaking. So it's created this unique surface property. It's almost like a crystalline, salty structure that is surprisingly easy to remove once the measures are in place to do so, but won't remove itself. So I'm sure 
the detail of this will come out. And I can't say too much. The nursery won't be washed away by rain, I suppose. No. Mm -hmm. it, rain, rain was said to only make it worse. And on the day, it had rained in the hour prior to the accident. Mm -hmm. But it was this classic case of it didn't rain too much yeah. and it didn't rain too little. <laughs> it rained just the right amount. <laughs> Very fine, <laughs> fine sort of hazy rain which created ultimately the perfect ice rink for the accident to occur. So it's sort of a case of all the jigsaws lining up uh, at this stage. I mean, I don't know that much more, and I think it's up to the investigators to formalize the detail. But I was assured I was about to show this. I think I'm a much friend. <laughs> yeah. wow. So this brings me on to the main part of the presentation, really, which is the work that I get on with and, and, and in some cases lead now, which is part of the RSSB Adhere program, um, very much the adhesion research challenge in short, uh, which is RSSB run and sets to achieve adhesion conditions that are unaffected by the independent and independent of weather and climate. So it's it's very our uh, mission is to be able to control adhesion to an extent where we understand what's going on and any unexpected unexpected circumstances don't um, unwelcomely inhibit our ability to monitor and mitigate the risks associated with low adhesion. So broadly speaking, we've got five strands of work that are part of this program. We've got wheel rail cleaning and studies into contamination and the detection of contamination that's very much laboratory based it's a case of understanding things at a microscopic level overlapping with this we've got the um, methodology behind this so the different um, systems and uh, rolling rigs and, and various um, pieces of apparatus that are used to support these studies so very much advancing the ability to model not just in reality, but also by sim computer simulation. We've got driver behavior, so how can we be proactive to avoid needing to be too reliant on the uh, mitigation strategies that we implement on the on the railhead or even um, in the case of vegetation management or, or anything else, which of course is very costly and in reality sometimes quite difficult to implement. Uh, changes to train design, um, what can we do to rolling stock to optimise sanding, to uh, optimise WSP systems for example to deploy at exactly the right threshold. I won't speak too much about that until the end because I'm, I'm aware that we're amongst uh, permanent wave friends and uh, I don't want to bore you with uh, rolling stock <laughs> software challenges that I don't understand myself. <laughs> You're all system engineers these days, as you said yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then forecasting adhesion, which is what I'll focus on most in this talk because that's one of the projects that I've been leading. So, link to add here is the RSSB Adhesion Research Group, which I'm a permanent member of, representing Chilton. We're effectively the committee that coordinates all these projects. Uh, as part of the Adhere research program. So our mission is to promote a wider understanding of the fundamental science and engineering behind the behind wheel rail ad adhesion and all related topics, um, such as the effect, for example, on track circuits. Ensure a common and system-wide approach to these topics by rolling stock designers, operators, rolling stock owners, infrastructure owners, maintainers, and various other suppliers. So it's very much a research group that's there for the entire industry, not just for one part of it. So our objectives to very much support Adhere's work, to um, track the progress of live projects and, and deploy support where possible, and also to cooperate with other research groups um, on similar matters <coughs> to ensure that our work isn't being um, duplicated in any unwelcome way or that we're not unnecessarily contradicting some of the work that other groups are doing. Now to distinguish here, this is very much a long-term visionary group. It's R&D focused. It's very much for the autumn after next and beyond. 
the seasonal challenge steering group, which I was also invited to sit on, but decided to focus on ARG instead. They're very much for next autumn, so I suspect that I might, there may be some people in the room that have sat on either group before, but the distinction is long-term vision and immediate problems between these two. Um, we also track worldwide activities with numerous presentations from international colleagues on new products in the market, such as, for example, new grades of sand. Um, in a recent case with a special electrostatically resistant friction coating, which is able to optimize the deployment of sand into the railway interface at speed. So and that was quite an impressive proposal, which the group may consider to invest, to uh, implement at least as a trial. And then there's generally a, a managing low adhesion manual, which is continually updated, which provides a continuous, uh, well, it provides a concise and but also detailed, uh, effectively, uh, it's, it's almost like your, your low adhesion dictionary. It, it provides all the information you need to um, um, be, be up to date with current standards, but also with um, ongoing R&D and examples of best practice. So um, to move on to the adhesion forecaster model that I spoke about, um, I'm the lead support for a project that's titled Understanding Leaf Effects on Low Adhesion. So the idea here is to understand <coughs> railhead contamination from a microscopic point of view, but then to take a few steps back and link it to its root cause, which is ultimately the vegetation and the environment in which that contamination is found. And then to use both of those pieces of information to create a really comprehensive data bank that can feed a low adhesion forecasting model. So to formalize that, we're looking at leaf chemistries, the times that particular leaves fall, and weather conditions, and the combined effect on the likelihood of a particular uh, condition of low adhesion appearing at any one time at any one location and then we seek to develop a framework for improved adhesion prediction using gathered data supported and scientifically justified knowledge of low adhesion from our SSB funded projects on oxides and small amounts of water. So the key features of this model covers physical attributes of track sites, drawing from primary experimental data that's very much analyzed at a microscopic level in the laboratory, um, informed and validated with instant data. So this is WSP uh, data from, in this case, a case study on the Chilton network um, that's very much monitored, that's very much linked to a particular location at a particular time. Um, that's then synchronized with a particular service frequency to really understand the conditions in which that uh, slip event occurred. And then the final outcome based on all these inputs is a heat map illustrating the low adhesion risk for a given route. And we hope that this model will shape an effective risk, risk assessment mitigation strategy for low adhesion um, based on location but also the type of mitigation that's recommended at that particular site based on the cause that we've attributed to um, the historic adhesion, uh, uh, slip events that we've looked at, but also then what we would expect to happen at that particular location in future. And as a result of all this, we hope that there's the potential of a significant cost and safety benefit across the UK rail industry. So to summarise the unique selling points, Utilising data inputs from both existing models, but also laboratory and field experimental data to produce a very comprehensive risk assessment and one that up to now has not, not ever been produced based on the same bank of data. So the unique selling point is very much, it's not just, we, we, we've, we've almost looked back at past incidents to get an idea of what ballpark we're in. And then we've zoomed into, we've used that as a clue to zoom into the areas that we're most concerned about. And we've then done much more detailed laboratory and field exper experimental based study on those areas. 
Um, importantly, the model is open source and can be modified if and when necessary. And it's also designed to be easily usable without specialist knowledge or training and uses data that can be easily collected and modified. So the methodology. Inputs varying from physical location, data from signal diagrams and environmental ordnance survey maps, as well as Google Maps where there was any doubt or where perhaps say, an ordnance survey map hadn't been updated recently, together with scientific information on tree type, but then also the distance of those different species of, of, of tree from the track, the level of coverage, the track radio and various other key track features, together with delayed data and the um, experimental work from um, the PhD student that I've been supporting all feed into something that will be more complex. This, this is just a simplified uh, diagrammatic representation. But in, our, in effect, we're looking at a heat map on a normal Google Maps or Ordnance Survey Maps interface, preferably switchable between the two based on the amount of detail or information you want on the page at any one time. It tells you with a red icon or a red shaded region that we've got a, a position of very high risk here for the low adhesion or the high likelihood of a low adhesion event occurring. Amber, somewhere in between, and green, generally of, of less concern, and then also resultingly of uh, requiring less need for mitig mitigation measures to be put in place. So, break these stages down into more detail. Um, our starting point was to look at Schultz and Will slide data from autumn 2018 to 20 and to uh, analyze this in terms of frequency and severity. We um, organized the sites we looked at into uh, the frequency of incidents and then grouped them as follows based on severity, low, medium, and high. It gave us very much an idea of where to start off and which sites to focus on as a starting point before moving gradually down the severity level. Then we carried out some site visits, so I was able to organise um, access to stations and also to small amounts of track, um, but also cab rides to effectively carry out our own completely up-to-date vegetation survey of the Chilton network, including its stations and uh, all its line-side vegetation. Do that very in with the Never Rail vegetation surveys, because they're logging all their trees and logging to, all their... To an extent. Um, the trouble is that network rail don't always give access immediately to their vegetation service. So <laughs> to, their, to their data to The data, data I, was, <laughs> I was regularly able to get access to was about 10 years old. Yeah. Which, you know, to an extent that, that, that initiates a plea from me to make data sharing a bit more easy yeah. across the industry. And I think, I think that's, that is a problem. And... On this occasion, I don't think there's too much commercial interest involved, but there has been historically, and th this data sharing has been one of the major obstacles holding up this project. So I think it's something that we can generally do better as an industry, and hopefully it's a key learning point for GBR as well going forward. Or future. Yeah. I hope Grant Shapps is listening. No. No. <laughs> um, so from vegetation surveys, we then moved on to uh, on-site leaf layer testing at Long Master. I'm not sure if everyone's aware where that is, but that's up in uh, Warwickshire. It's um, well, it's effectively a train graveyard for a long time, and it still is to an extent, but Portsbrook are tidying up. Um, but the good thing there is you've got lots of real track that you can just play with, and you can also hire a shunter to, in this case, run over some leaf layers. And, um, fortunately, the University of Sheffield is very well equipped with various um, tribology devices, tribometers, and um, this friction coefficient measuring pendulum as well, which is able to, in a very old fashioned mechanical way, determine the coefficient of friction just by running, by swiping over the, uh, the real world, uh, the, uh, the surface of the rail. Um, there's also a much more advanced tribometer, which I'm told is worth 50,000 pounds. <laughs> there's only three of them in the world and the engineering behind this 
is actually not that dissimilar to the corrugation analysis trolley. It's, all it's got is a little wheel that runs over the, <laughs> the, the, um, the railhead, but it's the software and the hardware that makes it so valuable. Um, unfortunately, I don't know exactly how it works, but what I do know is that we ran this shunter over pre-prepared mixture of different species of leaf, and gradually, under just the right amount of rain, as I was saying before, which did require a little bit of additional water added by us, but on this morning, and generally when you see clouds like that, you can fear that there's a an event, a lower, de lower adhesion event beckoning on the, on the horizon, because that, that sort of level of light generally produces that drizzly rain that optimizes <coughs> the oil interface for a really slippery event. And that's ultimately what we were able to produce at, at the end. Um, leaf layers that are, that are troublesome and generally uh, at the critical friction coefficient of less than 0 0.1 are black to the eye. They are so black that they reflect the sky in, 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 and mirror, very much mirror the, their surroundings because they, they're effectively like black glass, almost like a, like a blank TV screen. Um, so it's quite easy to tell once you have produced the leaf layer because you've, you've almost turned that vegetation into pure mulch, into a pure lubricant, which of course... Just an anecdote on that, spotting the sky there point. I remember I had the pleasure near the end of my career, unfortunately, to go into the control room of the district line uh, for a day. Uh, and, uh, and the guy in charge of the control said, the drivers know what the weather's like and how to drive. And he said there's a certain, the drivers will, will take account of the weather and slow down. So there's, yeah. uh, they take account of what they would call September morn <clears throat> type yeah. system. And so that was really interesting that they could tell by the conditions to slow down because they didn't want to get stopped uh, tumble off for a span. And also, uh, some people know that I experienced with commissioning the Doctors Light Railway. All right. And we did that uh, during a hot, dry summer. And then when the train services start, the passenger services start at the end of August, and then in September, September morn, then we got the train sliding through. So, small yeah. anecdotes. Was that the DLR right at the start? Or yeah, yeah. The original right at the start? 1983, yeah. So the wheel rail. Wasn't about, was it? On a viaduct in East London, miles away from any trees, that's where you wouldn't necessarily expect no adhesion. So it shows that this isn't all down to natural vegetation, it can be down to any other form of contamination. Um, just on the driver um, behaviours point, that's a major focus point of um, the adhesion research group. One that I'm not currently so actively involved in, though, as part of this uh, forecasting work. Drivers are one of my key stakeholders, so um, I try and involve them as much as possible in this. But there are people that are solely looking at driver habits and proactive driving behaviours to avoid lower adhesion events occurring in the first place, even if it's, it's all intensive purposes impossible to avoid because, for example, in the case of Salisbury, the mitigation procedures weren't put in place when they should have been. Yeah. Uh, those three images on the top to the right there, are yeah. they successive passes of the shunter? Yes. Someone on the line wants to ask a question. Yeah, very much so. So this was before any passes. This, this was one. after two, I believe, and this took about five. So it shows how quickly you can produce a leaf layer and how important it is to not just uh, treat, for example, the water jet, and I'll come on to this, um, a sectional railhead once a day, but in an ideal world, once an hour is what we're really talking on a, on a really slippery day. And, and another, I mean, this is still in its early stages of research, but another thing that's been looked at is that the immediate effect of treating the railhead with water actually worsens the problem because it, it allows leaves to stick to the railhead and it's almost like a magnetizing effect or you're kind of your own worst enemy at first and you're not in, you're only really uh, in theory in a state of perfectly low adhesion immediately after you've treated the railhead because it doesn't take long for leaves to fall again. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ray Pocock online, if you'll... Yeah, well, um, um, just to sort of what Jack said, then, 
high rate of heating, a little bit of rain, and all the problems of um, slant timing and rain. Sorry, Ray, you're not coming through very clearly there. Okay. Is he all right to type the question and then we can fill it at the end? That's generally the best <laughs> mitigation measure. <laughs> Questions in the chat? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Ray, yeah. If you, if the signal wasn't really very good, I'm afraid. Type quickly and I'll read it out for you. We can take it whenever it comes through. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Long Marston. Then looking at the vegetation survey and combining that with the data we found from the leaf layers we tested both in the laboratory and on site at Long Marston. Looking at things like the tree species, the level of overhanging on the line, also the density of the distance from the track and the depth of trees away from the track. And we put various weightings and uh, ranges of severity. Um, we, we associate all these factors with various ranges and uh, weightings of severity. And um, as a result, we're able to produce a spreadsheet that's far too big to show on here. But um, ultimately, the finalized data input for the model, which the software for is still being developed to produce a really optimal user interface. But I think the hardware and the import data is now finalized and available. And most importantly, it's easily amendable, not datable. And we're currently working to uh, liaise with other well, with, with the developers of other forecasting models to combine our data with theirs to produce an even more comprehensive forecast. And I'll, I'll mention an example of one of those shortly. So to summarize the development approach, we analysed Chilton wheel slide data as an initial case study. Uh, we aim to move on to additional networks one, once this trial has been completed. Um, we then built up data on each side, um, being physical attributes, tree coverage, the gradient key track features, all fed from signal diagrams, from ordnance survey maps, and also site visits. We scored the sites based on these values. We then used further sites to validate our original data and we're still going through this iterative process of validation to ensure maximum reliability of data and the final stage is to actually develop the heat map in a user-friendly interface. So once again here's an example at present the software isn't yet ready but this is in principle what we aim for it to look like. So next steps for development extend and ex expand and apply the model to different networks and compare to other risk assessment methods for further validation. Combine the inputs, as I just said, with other available inputs, such as portable remote OTDR, which I'll come on to shortly, aerial LIDAR, which is something that network development and which Chilton will soon have the capability of measuring on their own, on, on two units of their own fleet. And then finally to develop the user interface and to continually, this is not really a, um, this doesn't really have a time limitation, um, but the idea of the model is to continually update it and to expand and refine knowledge and leave chemistry and friction as and when it becomes available. So to talk about the Portabrook uh, model that's already in use, this is a live um, <coughs> system. Uh, their mission was to help Noah Rail target adhesion management on the track with poor adhesion and significant lost time. So it's very much a similar mission statement to what, what we have in our project. How? So use the GPS and remote OTDR data from Portsbrook fleets with the Sussex route, Sussex route in this case as a, as a starting trial route, to map and trend these areas, to then link work with the tracking of daily water jetting, daily water jetting vehicles. So again, links back to what we were talking about earlier to actually work out whether jetting is making a difference and whether the frequency of jetting is sufficient to adequately reduce the risk of low adhesion. And also, is it being targeted in the right areas? And that's really the question that our model seeks to address. Develop a visualization tool with the adhesion controllers that they buy into, and then to explore the opportunity to include non-portable fleets and further develop the map 
to show other relevant data sets. This is an example of the interface. So um, you can see here, that, I mean, this is very much zoomed out, but you can, I've been told, monitor low adhesion to the nearest 10 meters, which is more accurate than anything else that's available at the moment. So together with our model, we, we have similar targets. So we, in an ideal world, we'd have an interface like this with the power of having combined both sets of input data to produce an output that's, that's twice as powerful. Yeah. Right, Ray's question has come through. I'm just going to, um, it's more a point than a question. Um, he says, to add to Paul's comments on doctrines like railway, Delta Junction near Canary Wharf has a very tight radius and hard flange contact and vibration with very light rain. The problems of flange climbing ease significantly. Right. Any surprises? Is that no. True? Sorry, say again, Ray. No surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Was that pre modification or post modification? Pre. Oh, okay. So we've talked about identifying positions of, of low adhesion and starting to have an idea of where exactly we need to target mitigation measures. And the final part of this presentation really concerns what those mitigation measures might be and what, what areas of research are currently in development to improve the quality of not just how mitigation is tailored, but what is actually done on a physical level to reduce the risk of low adhesion. So, Generally speaking, the four available well, current, current ongoing streams of work in this area are traditional water jetting, optimizing that both by um, deployment, but also by frequency and location. Cryogenics, um, broadly speaking, dry ice, so solid carbon dioxide. Um, water track, that's very much high jet water, but at a much higher pressure than traditional water jetting and also actually fitted to rolling stock units in passenger service and high temperature plasma which effectively burns the leaf layers off the track and I have my concerns over electrical safety and the risk to passengers and maintenance staff. So I thought I'd focus on the one that's probably at the most adv advanced stage of development which uh, is being led by some of the colleagues that I work with on the low adhesion forecasting model, and that's cryogenic blasting for rail cleaning. So that's dry ice. The deployment of dry ice at high pressure to clean the railhead without any residue waste material, and importantly, leaving the railhead dry, which, at least in principle, addresses the bond problem of water jetting, which is that you have that wet film, that wet band on the railhead immediately after treatment. So this work seeks to deploy dry ice at high speed and assess the feasibility of the technology, notably being mounted on a passenger train. So part of this work is looking at adding this uh, technology to the railhead treatment train, but in an ideal world, passenger trains would be fitted with this technology such that a train can effectively manage its own risk of low adhesion whilst in service without relying on a separate uh, diagrammed path of a railhead treatment train. So there's a real capacity argument for this as well. And Sheffield have achieved this broadly through three sets of trials. Um, the trial on the Tyne and Weir Metro, which involved a railhead treatment train, the use of the Monk Brent branch line, trial the equipment fitted to a class 155 passenger train in passenger service and then at the University of Huddersfield Harold full scale rig testing. I'm not sure if anyone's aware of the Harold rig but it's probably the most advanced of its type in the world. It's effectively a complete uh, mock-up of the railway interface 
which can operate at up to 125 miles an hour. So very briefly, cryogenic cleaning mechanism. It's a means of using kinetic energy from compressed air streams to deploy um, dry ice pellets into the railway interface. The sudden expansion of gas aids in the removal of the coating, and then finally the thermal shock causes crackling and weakening of the coating and its eventual sudden removal. And all this happens in the space of half a second, if that. So we can treat the railhead. We can develop our understanding of the rail wheel interface, of railhead contamination, of where to deploy mitigation measures. But sometimes that isn't enough. Sometimes the train is slipping, you've got to bring the train to a stop in a safe way. And that's where the art of sanding comes in. And there's a whole RSSB funded Adhere project called Sander Good Practice, or Best Practice in Sander Maintainability, which then eventually produced the Sander Good Practice Guide, which looks at very much from a rolling stock point of view best practice in things like hose alignment, the deployment of sand, the spread of sand on the railhead, and effectively that's measured by what the, the profile of sand on the railhead following deployment and combination of, of the density across the railhead, but also the grade of sand. And that's where various um, suppliers, some of which are international, presented to the adhesion research group um, talking about things like uh, electrostatically resistant uh, friction coatings which improve, uh, improve our ability to control that spread of sand across the railway. So why is effective sanding so important? Well, I used to pick out four, I think I'll go down as near misses because no one was injured in any of these events, but four events that really gripped the railway industry in the last 20 years or so. Easter in 2005, a class 450 EMU was traveling at 90 miles an hour and had WSP activity triggered. It passed two signals of danger and slid for one and a half miles. 1.3 kilos a minute of sanding was not sufficient to be effective with the conditions encountered. Lewis, 2005, a very similar EMU again, travelling at 70 miles an hour, passed the signal of danger and damaged points and stayed again for a mile and a half. And there's evidence that even two kilograms a minute wasn't sufficient because it was only deployed for 10 seconds. So again, sander maintenance was the common factor. Stonegate on the 8th of November 2010, a very similar unit again, 375 EMU, slid from 64 miles an hour through a station over three miles. Oh, wow. <laughs> the unit had probably been in service with no sound in the office. Was, was it very down, much was it down a hill? Um, it's likely. It's just likely. <coughs> and then most recently, again, we must wait patiently. In this case, class 159 DMU slid from 86 miles an hour and on this occasion actually collided with another unit and slipped for a mile. Hopefully we'll find out more about that in due course. And I don't want to describe it as a positive, but if anything, it's woken up the industry, the adhesion research group and all associated groups to really start to implement some and speed up some of the R&D that's been ongoing for years and may not have been seen as urgent as it is now. It's always the case, isn't it? It takes yeah. some big accident, instant damage, something like that to properly yeah. get people working. Yeah. So I thought I'd bring it home at the end and talk about something that is specific to Chilton. Um, WSP testing and something that you know you don't get involved in every day because you don't commission new units every day. But this is effectively a DMU that's now got the ability to operate in fully electric traction, so with an electric motor driving the wheels, and has an electromagnetic clutch that is able to transition between diesel power 
and, and mechanical power to the wheels and electric power to the wheels. And the challenge there is how do you take a WSP system that's been developed for a DMU with purely mechanical transmission and make it work when the units also work in an electric mode. And after much testing, we decided it's the, the easiest way to go about this is to, dip, to disengage electric traction as quick as possible because there was no way that you were going to get the hardware and the software of the existing WSP system to talk both electrical and mechanical at the same time without developing an entirely new system. But the testing process behind this, I'm not sure if anyone's ever be, been involved in any of this sort of work, but um, it was to effectively create a leaf layer on the track. But on this occasion, we wanted to create a leaf layer that was easily controllable and easily removable. And we found that, and there is a standard governing this, again, I think, I believe it's covered in the um, adhesion uh, manual that I mentioned earlier, is that you put what's effectively um, brown paper, canvas paper, onto the railhead, and you just, there's this special solution that's effectively based on what's up with it, that you deploy down from the train onto that paper to wet that paper and, and create a certain level of, of low adhesion just as the train is passing over it. And that's that's the new standard of, of, of WSP testing, that you recreate the coefficient of friction of purely synthetic material, including synthetic a synthetic chemical solution as well. So that's something I wasn't aware of. And it was a very interesting insight. And here's the onboard laptop that's very much looking at the raw braking profile, uh, reading the on-train computer, um, which was then, of course, subject to further analysis later on in the laboratory. And then ultimately, um, there, there was an early attempt by the supplier of the, um, well, the, the, the manufacturer of the new power, power pack to uh, try and make the WSP system work both in electrical and mechanical mode, but it was decided that it was safest to disengage, to have a control system within the software that disengaged electrical traction, almost like ABS on the car, as quickly as possible, and then iterate through a very sudden but quickly adjusting braking profile um, to operating a pneumatic only mode. So to finish, here's a uh, video of the uh, 168 hybrid on um, the Tuxford test track, which isn't too far from Old Dolby, um, whilst this solution was being deployed onto the uh, that brown paper I mentioned on the track. <coughs> Is this in? I don't know how to play it. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Can you see here the WSP light? It's being activated. And the speed is being reduced very suddenly. That's step two braking. A very, this is, uh, it shows that you can achieve very smooth braking for a well-optimized WSP system. And on this occasion, the idea was to minimize the risk of wheel slip. We weren't applying an emergency brake application, so um, the intention was never to stop the train in a hurry. It was to pass that area of low adhesion whilst avoiding slip instant and subsequent uh, damage to the train on the tracks. So, um, yeah, that brings it very much back to what I do every day. On this occasion, it was sort of a combination of all the adhesion work I've been involved in before. But, um, it's it's a problem we'll, we may never get to the very bottom of, but the closer we get to the bottom, the better. But I think it will remain forever ripping stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to open the floor to any other questions. Thanks very much for listening.
Okay, I'm sure there's going to be some questions. Oh, it's fine. Right. Um, you, you say the various types of uh, dis dispensing on the rail, but there must be a problem in that you don't need it all the way on the route, and therefore somehow you've got to organise to be spraying at the right time before you run out on the train of, of the material you're using. Sand, it is. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that is coincidentally the root cause of at least one of the incidents yeah. that I mentioned. Um, in our case at Chilton, sanding is a very important part of our, what we call A exam maintenance program. Um, so, you know, at very most every week you would check for sand levels and ensure that the hoppers are full. Right, but how do you decide where you're going to be dropping the sand? <laughs> That's done automatically when, the, when WSP is activated, but Chilton actually now sand by default in break step one, which is quite unusual. Most operators wait till step two to sand, but we we um, sand by, with a relatively small amount, but we deploy sand in break step one. And this is activated during the highest risk times of the year. So um, I think generally it's up to the operator down to the risk assessment, which involves the consultation of drivers, it involves consultation of the ongoing, uh, well, the continually updated best practice guidance we receive, but it will vary with each operator based on the likelihood of low adhesion events occurring, but ultimately it's the driver that's in control. Yeah. The driver will deliberately apply the appropriate break step at a given location based on their knowledge of the route. And that knowledge of the route is tailored for each season of the year. So we do have internal adhesion forecasts, we have driver briefings, we have posters, we effectively have our own adhesion map. So the work that I've been involved in as part of the RSSB very much builds on what Network Rail already worked to and what operators already worked to. There is already such a thing as an adhesion weather forecast. My view on it would be it's not quite comprehensive enough to be taken um, totally at face value. Um, with the uh, the five p size wheel rail contact area, is there any suggestion? That there's a probably in one of the room except me knows this. There's an indentation, a temporary indentation in the rail. Yeah. And is there any suggestion that there's it's a called a regressive pit, I believe? Is there a wave effect of that? A wave effect? Yes. yes. A so wave before or after the contact? It, it can be. It depends what the uh, the mechanism behind that is. So rolling contact fatigue, for example, you'll get a very steady wave effect that does peak at a certain point. And the really interesting thing with railway rail wheel with the rail wheel interface and, and generally rail vehicle dynamics is that what you feel as vibration you won't actually be able to see because when you're traveling for example on an IEP at 125 miles an hour to Paddington if you're bouncing your seat or your cup of tea is vibrating that will be that won't be the rail surface that will be track undulations that will be fundamental deviations in the, yeah. the yeah. well there's, there's, that, that's 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 a failure in the mitigation of the root cause yeah. so, <laughs> the root cause will be the, the the geology of or the base of the track and that's not that that's the diff that's probably the most difficult thing to control is there any traveling wave effect at all significant um, or is it in, in terms of a pit on the track, that would be more audible sound. Yeah. So going back to the underground, <coughs> the underground is so loud because the track's very rough. Um, yeah, the, the track's past uh, Bensheim <coughs> in Germany where I used to live. Yeah. Have a high-pitched singing noise we don't hear in the UK. Very high-pitched sound. <coughs> very classic. Yeah. You know where you are when you hear that sound. I would guess that's corrugation. 
pretty, yeah, smooth right, yeah. pretty smooth ride on those trains. Yeah, Again, corrugation you would hear, you yeah. wouldn't feel corrugation as easily because it's generally it's quite, quite, it's quite high frequency. pitched. Don't hear it in the UK ever. The higher pitched it is, the smaller the wavelength yeah. of the damage on the track it made. That will be very high pitched because that's very short wavelength. Bloody smooth ride round there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not like you can draw big. Yeah. He mentioned uh, or what I would call a bow wave effect. Now, I have seen a bow wave effect which was pretty dramatic. And it wasn't on my patch, it was up on the uh, <laughs> East Coast main line. Uh, just south of Doncaster, if I remember, Bessacar Junction, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I discovered, after hearing the name of the place, Bessacar, that car was another word for a marsh. <laughs> and I saw this, what would it be, HST in those yeah. days, we're talking about something about 2000, mm. coming along. The track was, you know, climbing in front of the front wheel, basically. It, it was just totally out of my uh, knowledge because as I spent my working life on the western here much yeah. of which is good solid chalk formation mm -hmm. but coming back to uh, here um, in all the times I went in the cab as I was allowed to uh, encouraged to in fact from Reading to Paddington I don't think I ever <coughs> once knew of a, pro a driver having a problem with wheel slip mm. But there are two technical questions. One is, I seem to remember that steam engines, and we're going back an awful long time now, had sanders, but I thought primarily for getting adhesion when they were starting, yeah. rather than breaking. Yeah. That's I a good point. Yeah. So we've, we've mainly spoken about breaking today. Um, that's generally because accidents are more likely to involve areas of breaking, yeah. where you're trying to avoid a hazard ahead. Um, but Adhesion is just as much of a challenge when gaining traction, especially uphill. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's one thing that well, we looked at yes. quite heavily. With In your summary, several of the sets had sanding equipment, I think. Yeah. But did we go through a period in the 1980s, 90s, and I can't even think whether the 165s have or were built with sanding equipment, but did they have sanding equipment? No. They, well, they were right. Smart Six Flies were built without sand equipment, and it came into use after a 165 slid through Slough Station yes. into the up bay yes. and ended up the leading carriage. I believe the 166s were built with sand Sorry? equipment. I believe the 166s and the later 165s were built with sand equipment yeah, as a result. Ones, so yeah. Probably late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So the original the ones are the ones that show up. Well, the 165 on the backer stop was outside my office at SAS, and I got to work one morning and saw this set up in the air. But what was, comes back from that was that the driver, apparently, as I recall, said he slid all the way from Dolphin Junction, a good well over a mile. And I think I can say safely that management didn't believe him. <laughs> Uh, we've had a distinct change in knowledge. Yeah. But, but the other technical question was, when you've got a lot of uh, uh, stuff on the railhead and electric supplied overhead or third rail, is there an effect on the impedance of the electrical supply? Um, would, would the driver pick up a, an effect on his traction? Uh, I personally haven't looked at that area, but one area I am aware of is the effect on track circuits. Track circuits can no, be very easily lost. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and wheel contamination. And one of, I mean, you could spend days talking about everything that ARG does. Um, one thing that is in its infancy at the moment, as one of the Adhere projects, is that a study into the effect of both wheel set and railhead contamination on the performance of track circuits. The challenge there is that particularly on the Chilton network we've got sections of track that um, have track circuits and sections that have axle counters. 
So and that, that does change um, on, on several occasions along the network. And it's almost like you're solving one problem, but then you, you, you still have it with another system. So it's very difficult to uh, create a um, mitigation, develop a mitigation measure that deals with both types of signaling. Going back to the 1990s when I had the misfortune to deal with things like Sunday, mobile car, and whatever we were doing for um, Yeah. Uh, on the Golden Valley, Stroud Line, we did have some kit on the track which enhanced the track circuits. So there is something out there that may have got lost in the mist of time <coughs> that improves the reliability of track circuits. In my view would be that there's not much you can do to a wheel set because as soon as the wheel set goes over a um, section of contaminated track, it immediately becomes contaminated and spreads that contamination across a wider area. So I think the elephant in the room is controlling contamination on the railhead, which is why I focused on that today. We just got one online okay. for me. Uh, yeah, it's been typed up, so I'll ask it on their behalf. Mick James has asked a question. Uh, it says, high-pitched squeal was a feature of the straight line at Perryvale on the Paddington to High Wycombe direct line in the early 1970s, which I was told was due to an experimental rail steel. Question. Um, I've heard the reference. It's, I would again guess that that particular experimental steel might be more liable to rolling contact fatigue because that's generally one of the root causes of high pitched squeal in my experience. But I'd have to look at that particular case in more detail. Sorry, Malcolm, but trying to okay. get the people um, who are not here involved. Uh, two things. First of all, going back a little way, um, most routes had a mixture of freight and, uh, and passenger traffic on them. Freight trains with generally much heavier axle loads and so on tended to keep the rail cleaner. I was always the experience with it. There was also the other feature was that we controlled vegetation. Yes. Um, what I wanted to ask you, but that was really a comment, but what I wanted to ask you about your Chiltern Railway in particular, you've got a, 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 a a somewhat unique situation. You've got one part of your railway which is predominantly passenger trains and will have virtually no freight trains on at all, and then you've got another section which has got another um, another passenger train operator together with very heavy freight on it. Mm. Does that make any difference to um, the, uh, the, the the testing and so on that you've done? The fact that there are those heavy freight trains, I mean the freight liners that are running over there at fast at high speed, regular. Yeah. Does I, that make a difference? Unfortunately I've not done any on track testing on the Chilton network because it's very difficult to get track access. Uh, actual physical laboratory testing is or site testing has been done on test track and I think the business case for this project would have to develop quite somewhat still to and it may, it may not even be required given that it's only one input, but um, to actually get access to busy live rail track, that's a challenge in itself. But it goes back to the first part of the presentation on rail roughness. Mixed traffic creates a much more complex running band. Well, it effectively fuses multiple running bands into one. And all of a sudden, it's much more difficult to define a zero reference point and to work out where the center of the running band is, let alone how to define all the other sections. So that's, again, the, the work that I did some seven years ago now at university. Uh, I had a limited amount of time and a limited amount of access to track. In an ideal world, I would have looked at a section of track such as the one that you just described. But Old, day, old Dolby, you've, the section of track I was looking at was very much high speed rail, well not, not, not quite high, well 125 miles an hour section, with I think it was a step one braking section ahead of a junction. So, um, 
probably not the best example to look at mixed mode traffic. But the idea there was to have a basic understanding of how to measure rail roughness in the first place and to, de to develop a standard for the vast majority of rail track before looking at the more complex individual cases. What about your thoughts on, um, on things like the, the differing rail, uh, different wheel profiles against what is a single rail profile, or supposedly so? Um, there is, there's always, there's always the, uh, the, the criteria that <coughs> you've got to be maintaining to a condition which says this is the railhead in a condition that is just ready for either some action to it in terms of uh, uh, rail milling or, or, or that type of thing, or even re-railing, changing mm -hmm. rail, um, and against the amount of uh, the amount of wheel turning and so on is done to the actual stock itself. And if that is right at its limit, ready to be done next week sort of thing, you've got the two things that are furthest apart. The challenge there is, uh, because you know, that's not an error that I'm actively involved in at the moment, because obviously I don't, I don't work for an infrastructure maintainer. I'm not, I'm not sure what the current strategy within network rail is on that but from the conversations i've been having the broad view is the industry is in a state of flux we're currently in a situation where we're phasing out legacy rolling stock um, in some cases push pull traction so we've got on children's network for example we've got mark three coaches hauled by some of the heaviest diesel electric locomotives in operation in the uk r68 and 85 tons and they, I mean, there's a reason why they are the most expensive uh, sets to run that, that we have. They're, our track access charges for those um, very much dwarf <coughs> all others, and that's because of the damage to the track that they cause, particularly between the um, locomotive and the first car, and then the uh, effective, uh, the, the, the resulting. Um, reaction force effect on that coupling and, and the effect on the first wheel set on the on the carriages on the first carriage and the, the, that the mark three coaches that we operate they've realistically got a limited life um, as as do many other uh, rolling stock units in the uk you know the, the, there's we're currently in a in a situation where we're phasing out fast fleets of rail vehicles and I guess the question really ought to be asked in five years time of all the new rolling stock units that are now in service that have replaced the legacy fleets do we have is, is the rail wheel interface more standardized than it was before and as a result is it now more easy to manage because I think at the moment we're in a unique state of flux where it probably is more difficult to manage than it ever has been before. And that then has some overlap with low adhesion. And I question whether it's worth spending too much time looking, being proactive and looking from an R&D point of view into a problem that may not, and I emphasize may, not be with us in five to 10 years time. That's, that's, that's from a business case point of view. Thank you. Okay, have we got any any burning questions that need to be answered? Um, at which point I'd just like to say, Louis, thank you very much indeed. I think that has been very thought provoking um, and caused, uh, will create some discussion afterwards for sure. So thank you very much for that. Um, could I ask Malcolm to do the vote of thanks, please? With a great distance, you want me to come up Malcolm from Denno? I'll stay here. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, as, as I think a lot of us, we've been quite fascinated tonight because this is something that um, many of us as, as Pigway engineers, this has always been on our minds throughout, throughout the whole of our careers. 
I'll just go back to 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 one particular thing, which uh, which is always uh, interested me with it. Most travels are pretty lightweight nowadays. <laughs> so, which has an obvious obviously fact. Yeah, right. Going back to um, you know the mid 20th century and towards the end of the 20th century, um, not just with steam engines and so on, but in the sort of 60s and early 70s, we've still got unfitted freight trains. So in other words, the whole of the braking was being done by the locomotive. Um, <clears throat> so in those sort of cases, you've got the additional thoughts about Right. Well, the driver applies the brakes harder and harder. The weight of the train is also pushing him as well, which doesn't happen on, on, on trains nowadays. So we always had that effect. There was all sorts of things that used to be done at the time, and now Charmbrook Bank and so on on the middle of Main Line, and one or two of the gradients that you've got on Chilton as well. The train would stop, and the guard would fasten brake pin brakes down. So <laughs> you, know, you, you had to do it. You had to do these things. Well, the more freight trains that ran on a line, the cleaner the rail tended to always be, but it was bright all the way across the whole rail surface. You couldn't pick where the actual pattern of the, of, 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 of the wheel actually was. Very fascinating tonight, and you're obviously well into um, uh, you know, the theory behind all this sort of thing. Uh, all power to your elbow, it's something that really does need getting sorted out. Perhaps you should remind that word rail as well, that uh, the lead <laughs> might not be there in the first place if we did a bit more maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> and then you wouldn't have to do quite so much uh, investigation. You know. Anyway, please join me because this has been really interesting Okay, thank you, Malcolm, for taking on that responsibility. Um, Richard, next meeting, please. Next meeting, which is on the in, in early June. I haven't got the date here. Um, yeah, we, don't forget, we slipped it a week. We did. Because originally it was going to be the night of the start of the long bank holiday weekend. So we decided that would not be a good night to be trying to get people out, which was the 1st of June. So we've slipped it one week to the 8th of June um, to avoid screwing up the start of the bank long bank holiday weekend which starts Thursday morning yeah so better explained than I could ever do so anyway that's a good reason so 8th of June um, it's about on track plant um, uh, Michael Seidler from Switelski is coming uh, to give a talk about the, his um, operations he's going to talk about the current Switelski fleet and its deployment across the country and he's bringing a, a sort of colleague, as it were, from Plaza UK, uh, Richard Smith, uh, who will speculate about the future of machine developments. So quite a lot of stuff to do with machinery next time, next month. I hope that that will lead us into, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, resetting the, uh, our visit from our section to the Plaza works at uh, West Ealing. So let's see, see how we get on. So that's next month. Um, yes, it'll be at Hawker House here, yes. That's okay. Yeah. Do you have any other notices no, to no. round off? Okay. Well, that uh, just leads me to say thank you very much for making the effort for coming along this evening. Thanks once again to Louis for a very interesting talk this evening, very thought-provoking and uh, a lot of real high-grade technical information thrown at us there in all directions. So thank you very much for that. That was very interesting. Please do make every effort to attend the next meeting. I assume we're going to go for a beer somewhere this evening. Uh, are we going to the usual location? Well, I, mean, I don't know, because you want to get something to eat, don't you, as well? Oh, we do. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll make a plan on okay. our return to the city centre. Okay, well, yeah, if you feel you can spare a few moments to grab a beer, please do join us. And uh, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for coming this evening, and we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, a broad invite from the IMA Key. We have events mainly in Swindon, but anyone's welcome at any Southwestern Division uh, talks as well. You know, we, we do Obviously, we, we do our annual event, the PWI, but we have uh, other institutions come to talk to us too. So.
us the better because it makes us all stronger. And thanks to all those who joined us online. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.